Exactly. The fetus is doing very little exercise when it's in mom's tummy. It's doing kicking, and that's about it. It's not running a marathon. So its oxygen needs don't vary very much. But when it gets out and it's moving around, it has times when it needs oxygen more than others. So it needs that flexibility that comes with the adult hemoglobin. In the fetal hemoglobin, it's always in the high affinity state. It's always holding on to that oxygen fairly tightly. And that's OK because it doesn't need to give up too much oxygen to the fetus because the fetus isn't exercising. Once it's born, it needs that, and that's what happens. Now, there's one other last story I'll tell you about that which has health implications, and then I'll finally get off uh, of talking about hemoglobin. And that is uh, sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is a disease um, that's a genetic disease where the, uh, the person makes a type of hemoglobin that, is, uh, that forms a, a, a sickle cell. It looks, it looks like it's, it's instead of a nice round blood cell, when uh, the person who has sickle cell anemia uh, develops low oxygen conditions, say exercise or something like that, the blood cells, when they give up oxygen, uh, form a different shape. And the shape has a sickle. And it's rooted in the fact that the hemoglobin has a mutation in it, Okay, a very specific mutation. The problem is that what's a nice rounded blood cell normally makes it through the capillaries just fine, but when it has a sickle shape, it has sharp edges, it gets stuck in the capillaries, the very place where the oxygen is needed. It can be fatal. It, it more commonly is very painful. It stops people who have that disease from being able to exercise very much at all. Okay. And so in recent years, one of the treatments of sickle cell anemia has been to give people who have this disease drugs to stimulate their body to produce fetal hemoglobin. So now they start making a normal gamma, which is already in their genes. They're just not synthesizing it. And it keeps the cells from sickling. Yes, they will have a higher affinity for oxygen, but their blood cells at least won't get stuck in the capillaries, which is what's happening when they have sickle cell anemia. So that's a pretty cool story uh, relevant to that. It is not a cure, but for some people, it can provide pretty good relief. OK, enough of that. How about a song? OK, by popular request, we will have one. OK, you guys know Santa Claus is coming to town. Please join me um, in singing. Oh, isn't it great what proteins can do? I can't hear you. <laughs> Especially ones that bind to O2. Hemoglobin's moving around. Come on. Inside of the lungs, it picks up the bait and changes itself from T to R state. Hemoglobin's moving around. The protoporphyrin system, its iron makes such a scene, arising when an O2 binds, pulling up on histidine. The binding occurs cooperatively, thanks to changes quaternary. Hemoglobin's moving around. It exits the lungs, engorged with O2, inside of or in search of a working body tissue. Hemoglobin's moving around. The proton concentration is high and has a role between the alpha betas. It finds a metazole. That's histidine, by the way. To empty their loads, the globins decree. We need to bind 2, 3, BPG. Hemoglobin's moving around. The stage is the set for grabbing a few cellular dumps of CO2. Hemoglobin's moving around. And then inside the lungs, it discovers oxygen and dumps the CO2 off to start all over again. So see how this works. You better expect to have to describe the Bohr effect. Hemoglobin's moving around. OK. I don't hear enough of you guys. I hear too much of me. OK, so if we could change that, I think that would be good. All right. Uh, let's get back to more serious matters and talk about something that relates to all of this. Now, we've been thinking about tertiary structure, we've been thinking about quaternary structure, and I told you that a protein, in order to function properly, has to fold. Those bends that we see in there have to actually, those molecules have to sort of twist themselves around and position themselves around so that the protein can make 
its final shape. And that process is called folding, not surprisingly. And folding, it turns out to be, is, is a very, very important phenomenon. Okay? It's so important that cells actually have things called chaperones, which help proteins to fold properly. Sometimes, if a protein doesn't fold properly, there can be disastrous consequences, and I'll explain one of them to you in a minute. So to reduce the likelihood that that happens, cells make a special class of proteins called chaperones. They're actually called chaperonins, or we'll call them chaperones, just like when you're 14 years old and you go out on a date, right? <laughs> Your parents hope you don't get too, too folded during that process, okay? I expect a lot bigger laugh out of that, but okay. So the chaperones are there to help proteins to fold properly. Okay. Chaperones are made in increased amounts when cells get heated to a higher temperature. It's called heat shock. Almost every cell on the face of the Earth starts making more chaperones when the cell experiences a shock of heat. And from what I've told you about heat, heat causes things to come apart, to denature. Chaperones help them to fold properly. That's very cool. Now, as I said, if things don't fold properly, we have some very severe consequences, and you actually know about some of them. And you've heard about them, but you probably didn't realize that the problem was that with folding. And the problem is that of prions. Prions are uh, proteins that are misfolded. So a prion is a misfolded protein. That misfolded protein okay, um, is, um, it causes disease such as mad cow. It causes human disease, uh, and I'll give you the name, you won't need to know it, but it's called uh, uh, Hertzfeld-Jakob uh, syndrome. It's basically the human equivalent of mad cow. And the same sort of thing happens. The people who get this or the cow that gets this or in sheep, there's a disease called scrapie. Again, you don't need to know that. But these diseases all um, cause uh, dementia in the brain. And when we look at the brains of people who have this, they have these giant accumulation of what are called amyloid plaques. And these amyloid plaques arise from the, these misfolded proteins that accumulate, 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 and they start damaging nerve cells. You damage enough nerve cells in your brain, you lose brain function, and that's why people get dementia. The scary thing about prions is they arise from misfolding folding that doesn't get fixed by something else. It's a natural protein that you have in your brain, I have in my brain, etc. It's not a mutation. Let's make that very clear. The person who has the equivalent of mad cow disease has the exact same protein that you have in your brain. It's just folded, it started folding improperly. Whew, I'm safe, right? I don't have to worry about that. No, that's not the case. Okay. How a person's protein starts to misfold, we don't fully understand. But we do know this. Once you start misfolding one of those proteins, and this is kind of bizarre, it favors the next one misfolding, favors the next one misfolding, favors the next mis one mis misfolding, and you see literally a chain reaction, which is why these things start accumulating, accumulating, accumulating. Once you're diagnosed with this disease, you don't have a very long time before you completely uh, lose all function. Okay, they start accumulating. Now, there was a case, uh, a series of, of uh, cases of this human dementia in Great Britain back in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, where people started coming down with it in literally um, an epidemic. Okay, they were coming down with it quite frequently, and people began wondering why. Why is this happening? And what they discovered was that in Great Britain they were not at that time stopping, uh, their, they were not inspecting their cattle. And the Great Britain, before the human epidemic came out, they discovered that there was a lot of mad cows and they think the mad cow stuff made it into the food supply. Now it's controversial whether or not the consumption of, of beef that, contain, that came from a mad cow can actually cause the human disease, but the numbers would argue that that's possible. All right. So you're sitting here thinking, oh, well, I'm okay. I cook my food. I don't eat my food raw like I do. I like to go and, and order my, my hamburgers very, very raw. I like them mooing, okay? You say, well, as long as I cook my food, I'm okay. No, 
That's the thing. Cooking your food does not, underline not, stop that, does not kill that misfolded protein. It'll kill bacteria, it'll kill viruses, but this misfolded protein is so stable that if you want to unfold it, you have to heat the food to about 700 degrees Fahrenheit. A little warmer than we tend to cook our food. So I figure, if I'm gonna have, if I like my food relatively raw, I might as well have it that way because even the people who are getting it well done have just an equal chance of getting the mad cow from there. Okay, it's food for thought, haha, -ha. right? All right, so that's what misfolding and why folding is important. Questions about that? Yeah. It's not a mutation, that's correct. Well, because it's just simply a, a, a correctly made protein that hasn't folded properly. So the problem is not in the sequence of amino acids, but in the folding of the protein. Okay? Yes? That's kind of a random question, but is that maybe why the misfolded protein is more stable? Is that why it's um, continually misfolding? Because it's um, I don't know that the stability is what causes it to continue to misfold. I, I don't know that. Uh, it's a very uh, intensely studied uh, protein, as you might imagine, but I don't know if there's a link in that way. Uh, let's see, there's a hand, hand back here. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So what, so for humans, is that, is that the same case that Yeah. Again, it's it's not established. The the, the link between consuming uh, food from an organism that has it and that link to the human disease is not completely established. Uh, there are some suggestions that's the case. One of the concerns is uh, people who hunt wild animals, deer and so forth. Virtually every animal on the face of the earth can develop this disease. And so the concern is, have you shot a deer that you don't know has mad cow and now you're going to bring it home and eat it? And that'd be a problem. And that is a, a concern. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but um, it, is, uh, it, it is a tenuous link. Oh, oh, yeah. So they picked it up. Oh, I, you're saying that's an argument for why. I see. Yeah. Yeah. It could well be. Yeah. Oh, these proteins are amazingly stable. Probably the most, some of the stablest proteins on the earth. So I hand here. Okay. How would Well, um, the, that's a good question. The question is, is it contagious? or it doesn't arise independently. In the laboratory, we can actually stick this into a healthy cell and make it start misfolding that protein. But it's not proven that in fact that's how it spreads. It may be spontaneous. So the question is, is it always spontaneous? Can it be spread by uh, contact or not? And that's, that's just not established. So then it wouldn't be possible to eradicate it by eliminating all the infections? Again, until I do that experiment, I can't, I can't say. Yeah. It's a specific protein. It's a specific protein that's in your brain. And the interesting thing is that with genetic engineering, you can actually engineer cows, for example, that don't have it. And the question is, if you take this out and you make a cow that doesn't have it, does the cow function? Does it have a brain? I mean, what, this protein must be doing something. And from all outward appearances, the cow appears to be normal. Now, we can't ask a cow, is your brain normal, and then get that answer. We don't know. But the outward, uh, to all outward appearances, it appears not to have brain malfunction. Interesting point. Okay, just one or two more that I've got to finish here. Yeah. Yeah. Probably you wouldn't be able to just look at his brain and see that. No. Yeah. To detect it, actually, especially if it were at sub uh, uh, clinical levels of this. Uh, would take some very, very sophisticated lab tools. So it wouldn't be something that you would just look at and see. If it were very far advanced and you knew a lot about deer brains, you might be able to recognize plaques. But even there, we're talking about fairly small structures. Okay, let's see. Um, let's move on and talk about